Welcome everyone to our ongoing class in the Zohar. Let's get back to where we left off yesterday morning. The Zohar is moving on to another scripture out of the written Torah. And it will give us the esoteric meaning of that written scripture out of the unwritten oral Torah. Keep in mind, that is the way the oral Torah is structured. Almost all of them. Certainly, the Talmud and the Zohar are structured in this way. A scripture from the written Torah is given. And then, the esoteric interpretations and meaning of that written scripture is given. So this proceeds with, and this is the heave offering, which you shall take from them. Now that's the written scripture. The Zohar is now going to explain what the esoteric meaning of that is, what the hidden meaning of that is. And remember, the Zohar is equal in authority to the Torah. Ever since its emergence, the Zohar has been given equal authority to the written Torah. In fact, in uh, some countries, such as Istanbul and so forth, the Zohar is given more authority than the written Torah. So this is not just a kind of maybe interpretation that is being given by the Zohar. It is the explanation God gave to Moses but instructed him not to write down but to pass on orally. <clears throat> All of this is now true of this particular scripture and this is the heave offering which you shall take from them. Said Rabbi Eliezer, this verse has been interpreted and the inner mystery thereof explained. But there is evidently a contradiction between the above verse when it says that they take me a heave offering and what I am say and what is being said here. First it says take me. Then it says take my heave offering. Then it says take from them. However, the whole meaning amounts to this. Take me as a heave offering. Do you hear what it's saying? It's saying that this passage, this verse of Scripture, take this as the heave offering which you shall take from them. In the Hebrew, actually means take me, God, as a heave offering. That's what the Zohar is saying. Listen, how many of you catch that? Raise your hand. I mean, how many of you catch it now that I've explained it to you? That's extraordinary. God himself is an offering on the altar. That's what this is saying. God himself is to be a heave offering for the salvation of man. That's what the offerings were about in the temple, the salvation of man. And here God is instructing them in the hidden esoteric meaning of this verse to make him, God Almighty, a heave offering. Does anybody see any similarity between that and something else that happened 2,000 years later? Of course. Over and over again, Yeshua Hanatsri speaks of himself as God offering himself as a sacrifice to God for the salvation of God and man. Well, it's not just some Christian nonsense that he's saying. It's absolutely in conformity to the prophecies of the Oral Torah. I think this passage is just 
breathtaking. Absolutely breathtaking. Let me read it again. And this is the heave offering which ye shall take from them. Said Rabbi Eliezer, this verse has been interpreted and the inner mystery thereof explained before. But there is evidently a contradiction. There is a contradiction in the verse where it says, quote, that they take me a heave offering, unquote. First, it says, take me as a heave offering. Then it says, take my heave offering. And then it says, take from them, unquote. However, listen to this now. However, the whole meaning of this verse amounts to this, quote, take me, God himself, as a heave offering, as a sacrifice. Wow. 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 Just let that sink in. This is not a Christian gospel. This is not a Christian text. This is pre-Christian. It is esoteric, Judaic. Not only does it speak at length of the Messiah, but in a certain way it speaks of the Messiah as a kind of shaliach, as a kind of stand-in for God, as himself a sacrifice. Now that goes even a bit further when you look at Jung, who says essentially that, but Jung adds, God sacrifices himself on the cross, not for the redemption of man's sins against God, but for God's sins against man. Now, don't complain to me that you've never heard this kind of thing before. That's exactly why you are here, or why you should be here. Because, indeed, you've never heard these things before. That's why I'm here. That's why God has made me, for some God-unknown reason, a teacher to make known what has been unknown. Now, before you start thinking that that's awfully arrogant of me, let me add to you, for you, I have no reason why God would do that. If I were God choosing someone to do that, I would be the last person I would choose. Many people will say, oh, he doesn't know what he's talking about. The fact is, I do not know what I'm talking about. Because I am not doing the talking. It is not I who say these things, but the Father dwelling in me. So these radical, radical teachings that you hear coming out of the Zohar through me are indeed radical. And the fact that you have never heard them before does not mean they're wrong. However, the whole meaning of this verse amounts to this. Take me, God, as a heave offering. But who should they take? The children of Israel. And from whom should they take? From every man whose heart impels him. Namely, from the supernal angels above, upon whom this heave the Shekhinah is raised. Those who perpetually raise the Shekhinah up to the supernal king. And when Israel is worthy, they take her from them and bring her down. The Shekhinah is to be sacrificed on the altar. And the Shekhinah, of course, is God. The Shekhinah is the indwelling presence of God. That's how the Shekhinah is defined. Who is to be sacrificed? The Shekhinah. By whom? By the children of Israel.
However, the whole meaning amounts to this. Take me as a heave offering. But who should take? The children of Israel. And from whom should they take? From every man whose heart impels him. Namely, from the supernal angels above, upon whom this sacrifice, the Shekhin, is raised. Those who do perpetually raise her up to the supernal king. And when Israel is worthy, when Israel is worthy, they take her from them and bring her down. Notice something. It does not say, as I first said, and it's easy to slip into this. It doesn't say anything about the children of Israel. It says Israel. The children of Israel is a very specific reference to the Jews. When Israel alone is mentioned, it means the house of Israel, which includes the Gentiles who have come into the house of Israel by being brought in by adoption by the Jews in there. Israel, the house of Israel, is equally Jew and Gentile, or should become equally Jew and Gentile. The children of Israel are the Jewish people alone. This refers only to Israel. Israel, Jew and Gentile, who have come into the house of Israel, who have come into the house of God, are worthy to raise up and sacrifice the Shekhinah. And once they have done that, and she joins back with God, they also bring her back down. Let me, let me give you a very, very pointed example of that. In the Jewish Sabbath, in the 25 hours of the Shabbat, the point, indeed, is to reunite the bride and the groom, the Shekhinah, below, with her husband, above. And that is, if one does it with the proper kavana, that is what is accomplished. However, having united the male and the female in the Shabbat, pay attention now, at the very conclusion of the Shabbat, they are disunited in a particular ritual. That's good. It, it's exactly what's being said here in the Zohar. First, the Shekhinah is raised up by the Shabbat, and then it is brought down, back down, by the ritual that is performed at the end of the Shabbos. That ritual is just loaded with esoteric and occult meaning and performance. Let me let me read it to you. Hang on. Well, I can't quickly find it. But just take my take my word for it. It's performed at the end of the Sabbath in a darkened room with a three wick candle with a container of spices and a cup of wine. And the purpose of it is to separate the sacred from the profane once again to separate it. That is exactly what we see being prophesied and spoken of here in the Zohar. Israel raises up the profane to the sacred during the Shabbos and at the end of the Shabbos performs this ritual to separate them again. How many of you are following this Raise your hand. Yov, are you there? Do you hear? 
Europe may not be there. The ritual is called Havdalah. The ritual is called Havdalah. And let me, I found it now, let me indeed, let me indeed read to you what is done and said in the Havdalah. This is at the very end of the Shabbos. Man. Over a cup of wine, fragrant spices, and a candle with three flames on it, this is recited. Behold, God, and it's in Hebrew, of course, that one recites it. Behold, God is my deliverance. I will trust and will not be afraid. Truly, the Lord is my strength and my song. He has delivered me indeed. Joyfully shall you draw upon the fountains of deliverance. It is for the Lord to bring help. My God, thy blessing is upon thy people. The Lord of hosts is with us. Notice, uh, not, not just the children of Israel, but us, Jew and Gentile alike. The God of Jacob is our stronghold. Lord of hosts, happy is the man who trusts in thee. O Lord, save us. O Lord, save us. May the king answer us when we call. The Jews had light and joy, gladness and honor. So be it with us. Do you hear that? Now that's, that is the ancient Havdalah prayer in Hebrew. It says, the Jews have had privilege with you. Now show that privilege to us meaning Gentiles as well as Jews who have come into the house of Israel, as many of you have through me. That's how it's done. It goes on. So be it with us. I will take the cup of deliverance and will call upon the name of the Lord. And I will call upon the name of the Lord. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who createst the fruit of the vine. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who createst various kinds of spices. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who createst the lights of fire. Blessed art thou, Lord our God, King of the universe, who has made a distinction between the sacred and the profane, between light and darkness between Israel and the other nations, between the seventh day and the six working days, blessed art thou, O Lord, who hast made a distinction between the sacred and the profane. At that point, the three-flame candle is extinguished in the wine that has been poured out into the saucer. And everyone dips their fingers in that wine and baptizes themselves with that wine. Oh, and prior to the three flame candle being extinguished in the wine, everyone who is there looks at the reflection of those flames in their fingernails. How do you like that for a theurgic ritual? Once that's been done, then the flame is extinguished in the poured out wine. The poured out wine. And everyone baptizes themselves with that poured out wine. Good God. Do you see? Do you understand how this is a prefiguration? Not only of the sacrifice of the Christos, but how the blood of the Christos is poured out for man who takes it and is saved by it. The problem with this is that Jews don't want this because they believe it's too Christian. It is not. It is Zoharic. Christians hearing it totally misinterpret it and do it all within the context of oh yeah, Jesus was God Almighty. That is not what this is saying. The blood of the Lamb is not God but contains God. 
in the sacrifice. The bird cage is not the bird singing in it, but only the bird cage of the bird singing in it. This the Christians cannot and do not understand. And what the Jew is rejecting, and now without even knowing the reason, in this kind of interpretation is because of the interpretation that the Gentiles give to it. <clears throat> I'll stop here for this morning and uh, ask, take down your hands, and I'll ask you for comments, questions, feedback, reactions. Just raise your hand. If you have any. Yesod, go ahead. Chavah, go ahead. Yeshai, go ahead. Ask, kick, and exegesis, says Yesod. Amazing to be here as we unwrap the cords that bind this holy book. And through your teaching us, these mysteries of the Almighty are revealed. I believe in my heart of all that you do, allowing the God to speak through you. Thank you. Believe me, it's no special honor for me to me for that to be true. Thank you, Isod. Each day here, and it is that that I hold dearest. God bless you. Thank you, Isod. Eloquently and beautifully said, and I really appreciate what you're saying. Thank you. Chave, Yeshai, Isod. Eov, go ahead. Chave, to hear God sacrificing itself for its own sins to man. Wow, this is amazing. God used as an offering the Shekhinah tears, shaking and shivers. Boom, thank you. This ritual with the three-wick candle, the wine and box of spices. Wow, yeah, it's it's beautiful to do. I've done it many times in the past, and beautiful to participate in. And to watch the flames of the candle in one's fingernails. Isn't that amazing? Isn't that amazing? Don't tell me that Jewish ritual is not theurgic. It is. Baruch Hashem. Thank you. Thank you, Chava. Yisod, go ahead. Did I say Yisod? I mean Eov. Pardon me. <laughs> Thank you, Yisod, for your comment already. Eov, go ahead. Eov, the thing that Christians misunderstood and so the Jews reject, yes. That's exactly right. They misunderstand it and so the Jews reject it without remembering why they're rejecting it. Wonderful words from the Ruach Thank you. Thank you. How's that little boy doing? He's just looking more and more gorgeous. Every picture you send of him. I just want to take those cheeks and pinch him. <laughs> How is he doing, Eve? And and how is the mom doing? David, go ahead. Go ahead. And he's playing in front of you. Would you give him a big kiss on his beautiful cheeks for me, please? <laughs> oh, that's wonderful. I can see him. I can see him. Thank you, Yov. David, go ahead. Here, By the way, here is the title of the 
talk this morning. It's a long title, but it is the title. Please type the title exactly as I have spelled it here. The Shekhinah sacrifices herself on the altar for the sins of God against mankind. That's the title. Please copy that and, and uh, use it exactly as I've typed it. Thank you. David, go ahead. David. Wow, just amazed. Yeah, we're glad you're here, believe me, for more than just one reason. Really glad to be here and to hear it, as I doubt anyone else would have ever shared these teachings. Well, the Zohar is sharing them, but the rabbis do not. They don't. Yeah, you're right. They make the more sense of anything I've ever heard, doesn't it? It does. I love the theurgic rituals described and their inner meaning. Thank you. Thank you, David. God bless you. Wonderful. I love these comments. Any other last-minute comments or questions? Please raise your hands if you do. Isad, go ahead. Anyone else? Last-minute comment or question? Just raise your hand. Commented above mine. What? I haven't typed a comment, Yishai. I don't know what you mean. Just resend your comment, please, Yishai. I, I I don't know. I don't know what you mean. Oh, oh. All right. Let me look at the title. Hang on. Here, Yeshai, Korea slams on the take me as a heave offering, as God sacrificing itself. Revelation. Yeah, right on, Yeshai. Amazing theurgy in the Havdalah, and its exact parallel to this Zoharic plumbing beyond the garment. Oh, this is a beautiful comment, Yeshai. Baruch Hashem. Thank you, Abhiji. Thank you, Yeshai. Great comment. Thank you. Thank you for pointing out where it is. Great comment. Again, any last-minute comments or questions? Thank you. Great comment. Kriya slams on the take me as a heave offering, as God sacrificing itself. Amazing theurgy in the Havdalah says Yishai. Beautiful. Thank you, Yishai. Yes, it is amazing. All right, everyone. That uh, that concludes our, our uh, class for this morning. Remember, tomorrow morning is Friday, Erev Shabbos, and we will have our class exactly the same time, 8 a.m. Eastern Time, right here in exactly the same place. In the meantime, have a wonderful day today just wonderful. And I'll see you, God willing, tomorrow morning.